Brother Steve. Good morning, church. Uh, I also want to just give a, a brief thank you shout out to our workers who fixed this row of light. So uh, brothers and sisters on this side of the auditorium, you now have light. Uh, so thank you to our hard workers in that department. One of the privileges of uh, having a cat as a pet is I get to watch a cat squeeze through tight places that you would not think physically possible. Uh, if you don't have a cat, you haven't gotten to experience that sort of phenomenon. Uh, but cats, the, the joke is that they can make their bodies liquid because for whatever reason, like they can condense their, their, their bones and muscles and they can maneuver into some weird places. Uh, so like for instance, when Ashley and I moved to Memphis, we had just gotten married. Uh, we, that was my introduction to her cat. We, we took her cat River down with us, uh, moved into the house and it's unfamiliar environment, like the cat just bolts, right? We didn't see the cat for two days. No idea where this cat is. Finally, we, we find her hiding behind the dryer and the washer, just like wedged up tight against the wall. That was her safe space away from all of this weird new stuff. You would not have thought, I mean, this is a, you know, a nine, 10 pound cat, cat. How did she do that? Cats can just do that. Uh, you will see all sorts of funny pictures of cats. I, I thought about putting a whole bunch together, and I just decided I'd leave it to your imagination. But cats can curl up into bowls. They can fit in cups. They, they just love going into things and contorting their body. It's just what cats do. People can't do that. I, I don't know if you've tried. Um, right? the, the classic thing that I think humans particularly experience is when you put your head through a bar, and you're like, oh, yeah, I can do it. And then it's trying to get your head unstuck from the bar. At least as a child, I did that. Maybe you guys had better common sense than I did. But like our bodies are just nowhere near as uh, manipulative in its shape and construction as a cat's body. People cannot just change their shape to fit through things. Jesus is going to travel from place to place in the Gospel of Luke. And along his travel, someone's going to ask him about salvation He's going to talk about a door. This is a door that you will not be able to twist and shape your body to fit into. There is one way, there is one door. You're not going to be able to change the environment and the factors. It is just the way it is. I appreciate Jesus' encounter and teachings in Luke. I hope I can share some encouragement and some gospel proclamation with you today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 13 if you would like to turn your bibles and open up there luke chapter 13 we'll start here in verse 22 luke 13 22 he went on his way through towns and villages teaching and journeying towards jerusalem and someone said to him lord will those who are saved be few and he said to them strive to enter through the narrow door for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. For once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. All right, I want to keep in mind the context of this conversation and illustration. Jesus is a Jew. The Jews have been God's covenant people for a long time. Uh, Hundreds, thousands of years, Abraham down the line, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as are brought up in this story, these have been God's people for a long time. And Jesus is one of them. And he's talking about God and salvation. So in their minds, we're dealing with Jews. They know what separates Jews from the rest of the world. 
is that they serve the one true God. They are God's people. Collectively, they belong to God. God belongs to them. That is how they see this. The problem is, too many Jews at this time seem to have assumed that simply knowing the right God gave you the same privileges as following the right God. It seemed as if they thought salvation was by association with the right God. And I think Jesus in this parable is going to set the record straight. Salvation is going to be through the right door, not by right association. So the New Testament, uh, through Jesus and then all of his disciples and followers as they write their letters, they're going to just continue to make this clear. Salvation is in part a choice by you to go through the right door not simply hanging around the right door. You have to make a choice to enter into the kingdom of God. I I think Paul gives great illustrations to say it's a free invitation. All are welcome, but you still have to make the choice. Uh, And and I think if if I'm going to make this parallel, what Jesus would say to the church today, instead of just saying this to Jews, is that you are going to be saved by Jesus and your faith and submission in obedience to Jesus, that right door, you're not going to be saved simply because you know who Jesus is and you know what the Bible says. Knowing the information, that to me is just kind of that right association. That's not going to be what saves you. What saves you is going through the right door. At least according to the New Testament, This teaching remains consistent. You are saved by Jesus. You're saved by God and faith in Jesus. And that is the only pathway to salvation. This is why it's a narrow door. There are a lot of doors out there in the world. There's the law of Moses and Judaism. That's a door. There's Buddhism. That's a door. There's Islam. That's a door. There's paganism. Lots of doors there. There's a lot of doors. Jesus is, is teaching there is one door that you are saved when you go through. And just because you hang around the door is not going to work. So touching the cloak of Jesus, listening to Jesus, having a meal with Jesus, as many of these people did at the time, that still is not going to save them. What will save them is faith and submission to Jesus. I think this is one of the reasons it's, it's foolish for Christians today to talk about which denomination is saved. That's almost kind of the same sort of question and vibe I get from this of like, hey, which group of people are saved? And I think Jesus at this point is just knocking out that whole topic to say groups of people are not saved. You are saved. Individually, God saves you from your sins by your faith and submission to Jesus. But God is not going to save your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your children or your neighbor or your friends simply because you also happen to be saved. That's not the way this works. Each one of you must go through the right door. It's not by right association. So to say which denomination is saved, is it the Catholics, is it the Baptists, is it the Presbyterians, is it the Churches of Christ? You're asking a foolish question. Because association with the right kind of church is still not going to save you. Only the right door, which is Jesus, is actually going to save you. (coughs) Salvation is not, (coughs) excuse me, it is not simply being close to the truth. It is believing and submitting to the truth. (coughs) I'm just going to be honest in my own confession I think I've preached some sermons that Jesus would disagree with because as, as, as much as I think I try really hard to get what is right, I'm not Jesus. I don't know as much about God as Jesus knows. Maybe that surprises some of you. Sometimes it surprises me. I just, I just, there's a lot going on in our Bibles, right? Like there's, there's a lot going on. The reality is I have probably stood before you and said something wrong. That's just reality. I'm not going to be saved, though, just because I preach the right kind of words. And you're not going to be saved just because you listen to the right 
kind of words. You are going to be saved because you go through the right door. And that is going to, as I say, be faith and submission to Jesus. Uh, I, I think the elders here, they're wise. I love them. I respect them. I don't think they're going to get every church policy right. That's just reality of being human. They're going to make poor decisions sometimes. That's just what leadership and humans do. But you're not saved, and your salvation doesn't rest on how good the church elders are. You can have really bad church elders. And again, I'm, I'm on the record to say I like our church elders. They're good church elders. But you can have bad church elders and still be perfectly saved. Because it's not about the church leaders. It's about the right door. Do you remember the, the old game, Deal or No Deal? Deal or No Deal was, was this, this game on, on TV where they would put 26 silver briefcases up on stage. And in each briefcase is a number ranging, I think it was from one penny all the way up to a million dollars. And so it would go from like one penny to 50 cents to a dollar to five dollars, 10, 15. But you would have a million and 500,000 and 250,000. You'd have some really big numbers to offset it. And the way the game works is a, the contestant on the show, they pick one of the 26 briefcases and then they hold on to it shut. And then they begin to open briefcases one at a time in batches. I think it starts with like pick seven at a time and then six and then five or whatever. And after each interval, the bank would call and say, we will offer you a deal based on what's on the board and the statistical probability that you would pick something higher. We're going to offer you a deal. And the, the deal is going to be comparative to which cases you have opened. So I, I, I use this as an illustration to say there's 26 numbered cases. If case number 25 is a million dollars and you picked case number 24, do you know how much you win? Zero. There is no value in simply picking the case next to the winning case. If you're... If, you're, if you picked case 24 and that was a penny and case 25 was a million dollars and you decided to stick with case 24 and you open it up, you won one penny. That is the way the game worked. There is no right association. Just because you get close just doesn't mean anything. Uh, during this past week, I, I was on vacation with my family, my, my side of the family, uh, and I was playing cornhole with my, my father and my brother-in-laws. I'm going to confess before you guys right now, if there is any particular skill the Holy Spirit has not gifted me in, it is cornhole. And my dad was really good. My brother-in-law was really good. And they're, they're, if you haven't played cornhole, you're tossing this beanbag into a, a wooden board and you're trying to get it in the hole. I don't know why it's called cornhole. Someone else can explain later. Maybe you used corn on the cob in the past. But you're, you're tossing these beanbags into this hole my, my dad and brother-in-law, they're either getting it on the board, which is a point, or getting it in the hole, which is extra points. And they're just one after another after another, on the board, in the hole, on the board, in the hole. So that's my turn. I, I'm tossing, and it's hitting the board and flying off. Hitting the board, 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 falling off. Not hitting the board. Not hitting the board. Just over and over again. This, this is my pattern. Every time, I love my father. He's going, oh, you're so close. Oh, that's so close. I contributed like nothing to this game. I was the worst partner imaginable for my dad. I, I think we scored like 13 points and I scored one. Like it, I was so bad at this game. Every time he goes, you're so close, so close. Being close just means nothing. Like just because you're close, it means nothing. It is either yes or it is no. Jesus is trying to set the rules of salvation. If you are saved, it is yes <laughs> Or it is no. There is no, well, you know what? You are really close to being saved, so like, come on in. That's pretty good. Like, that's just not the way it works. You are saved by entering the narrow door. Do I have verses 25 and 27 as the next slide? Perfect. So, so 25 through 27, this is how he's trying to illustrate this. The master of the house has risen and shut the door. You begin to stand outside and, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. And he'll say to you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Like notice the defense of the people. Like they're saying, wait, 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 wait. We're outside the door. Don't you remember us? Like we, we were there. We had, we had food together. 
Okay. Jesus is teaching a story about faith, submission, obedience. Eating together is nice, but that's not faith, submission, and obedience, right? Eating together, we, we were in your presence. Does being around the right person mean you follow the right person or you listen the, to the right person? Uh, you taught in our streets. Okay, just because Jesus came to you and he preached to you doesn't mean you're saved just because he was there. Jesus is saying this is not how it works. I'll try to make this comparison crystal clear. Going to church, reading the Bible, praying, being baptized, having Christian families, listening to Christian music, wearing Christian jewelry, having Christian tattoos, all of that is fine if you are going to actually believe in Jesus and commit your life to him. If your faith in Jesus is not actually there, then you are just all around the edge, right? Going into a church building does not make you a Christian, just as much as walking into your garage doesn't make you a car and going into the ocean doesn't make you a fish. Just being there doesn't change who you are. What you are and who you are is based upon how you respond to Jesus' call, come follow me. If you follow Jesus, then you're a Christian. And I'm not going to judge how well you follow Jesus compared to another brother or sister. That's just, Jesus isn't concerned about how well each of you do compared to one another. He's concerned about, do you love him? Are you following him? If that's the case, please continue reading your Bible and praying and going to church. Those are all great things. But his, his point back to the Jews is simply being close, which I would say, hey, if you went to church and you're doing all these great things, like that's, that's close. If you don't believe in Jesus, doing the good stuff is just not going to get you through the door. Because then you can say, wait a second, Jesus, I went to church. I put money in the collection plate. I showed up to events. Why don't I get to be saved? And Jesus is going to say, well, did you follow me? I didn't ask you just to go to church and put money in the plate. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to humble yourself and trust in Jesus for salvation. I'm asking you to say you are not worthy, but you will follow a Lord and Savior who is worthy. That is the narrow door by whom we walk. Well, that's, that's the door that we walk through, right? Uh, you can buy a concert ticket, but if you don't go to the concert, then that ticket means nothing, right? So you can go to church, you can be baptized, but if your faith is not in Jesus, the going to church and baptism just doesn't mean anything. Like the, the core part uh, of what is going on is going to be faith itself and this commitment to Jesus. We can talk a lot about grace. I think Jesus is, is a huge proponent of grace and forgiveness. His followers are proponents of grace and forgiveness. I'm not trying to set the standard to say you need to go and be a perfect Christian to be saved. I don't think that's what Jesus is even trying to teach here. But what he is trying to teach is that there is one path for salvation. There is one door. The reason it's a narrow door, the reason it's few who get to enter, it's because you have to truly choose Jesus as Lord and Savior. And a lot of people just aren't willing to do that. Like at some point, you have to make that decision. I think a lot of you could, could just reflect on your own lives. And you could look at your pre- and post-baptism story. We did this a couple months ago. I encourage you to reflect on that moment you really believed in Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus. I think a lot of you would, would probably just confess and say you were not some terrible, trashy, horrible person before baptism. And you magnificently became a wonderful, nice, compassionate saint all of the time. Like, that's, like you probably wouldn't assess your own life that way. Maybe some of you would. I think a lot of people would say there's been a journey, there's a gradual journey, but yet the point of salvation is still choosing to go through the right door. It's not about the immaturity or the maturity. It's not about how much you've done. Like, what matters is have you gone through the right door? The sin of humanity is often thinking that salvation is only for people like us. It doesn't matter what denomination you're a part of. It doesn't matter what ethnic group you're a part of. I think that's just one of the, the problematic sins of humanity. The only people who will be saved is if they think like me, if they act like me. We're the only people who will be saved. I think that was an issue for the Jews that Jesus is trying to push back. It's not about the, 
the people, it's about the door. And are you going through the narrow door? So Jesus is then going to give a much bigger teaching. If you go through the door, this is what you're going to realize. Inside this door is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is composed of all kinds of people. I think with, without a doubt, one of my favorite parts of worshiping here at Northlands is that there are just all kinds of people in this church. We've got different skin colors. We've got different accents. We dress differently. We've got different ages. We've got different uh, work backgrounds. We've got different beliefs in a lot of various obscure things on the Bible. But we all come together on Jesus Christ. We all come together on our Lord and Savior in the narrow door. And I love that about this church. We are composed of different kinds of people. And Jesus is trying to make sure we understand the kingdom of God, that is composed of different kinds of people. Again, here at the Northland Church, we have Ghana, we, ha we have the various countries that belong with the Hispanic church. We've, we've got our English church, and we come from different states and different backgrounds. We've got a lot of differences in our earthly experiences, but we come back to faith in Jesus and saying we're all entering that narrow door. And so now the kingdom of God gets to be composed of all kinds of people. So we'll go ahead and pull up verse 29. It says, People come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. His point is that it's uh, to, the, to the people at the time. It's not being a Jew that saves you. It is not simply being by association, Jesus is a Jew, and he is there, and you're a Jew, and you are there, therefore you're saved. That's not how it works. It works by going through the narrow door. And anyone is invited to go through the narrow door from east and west and north and south. It's the easiest way of just saying everywhere. People from everywhere will compose the kingdom of God. Again, I, I preached in Revelation 5 not too long ago. I love how Revelation 5 puts it. People of every tongue and every tribe, every kind of person is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory and honor and obedience be unto his name. That Everyone's going to do it. Well, this is, Jesus understood this from the beginning. Everyone, east and west, north and south, they're all going to be a part of the kingdom of God if they go through the narrow door. People won't always look like us. People won't always talk like us. They won't act like us in a lot of cultural ways, right? My generation acts differently than many of your generations. I was having this conversation with some of my younger siblings. I think they belong to a different generation than I do. I think that six-year gap is a sizable gap. And I think they just act differently in their mid and early 20s compared to my now 30. Like, I think there is a gap between our ages. It doesn't mean one is right or wrong. We just act differently, right? I'm, I'm, I'm 31. I sit in a room of elders who are all north of, I, I believe, north of 60, yes? We're, we're all north of, I, I'm not going to super judge. I think they're all north of 60, which is, I, I'm not, there's no shame in that. But, you know, they think differently than I do. And I think differently than they do sometimes. It's not right or wrong it's just the fact that i am literally like half their age and under like i'm young enough to be some of their kids well, quite by literal age like that's just the way it works that's okay we're allowed to be different difference is not going to be what kicks you out of or invites you into the kingdom the kingdom of god is just composed of all kinds of people the important thing to keep in mind is jesus tells this story it's it is the kingdom of god it is not our kingdom. It is God's kingdom, and he sets the rules. And so God says, in my kingdom, you will come from east and west and north and south. So it is not up for me as preacher to decide who gets to go into the kingdom of God. It's not up to our elders. It's not up to the churches of Christ. It's not up to America. It is simply up to Jesus and Jesus alone. He gets to be the judge working hand in hand with the Father, but they make the decision. Who is in the kingdom of God? Who is not in the kingdom of God? <clears throat> the declaration from this story is going to be from every, everywhere. North, south, east, west, everywhere. I think if you read the Bible closely, though, Genesis all the way to Revelation, read it closely. Pay attention to each story. This message 
that they come from everywhere, from every direction and every kind. That's evident. You don't see only Jews. In fact, the, the more you read it, I think the more you will come to understand that God has always welcomed specific people. It's never been about just God's people. There's a special place. There's a special covenant relationship between God and Israel. I'm not trying to diminish that. God loved his people. He set a covenant relationship with them. I get that. That should be remembered. But he has never just said it is Jews and Jews alone. That's never been God's motive and rules. He's always welcomed specific individuals. Think about Job, right? Remember Job? Job chronologically... Uh, is probably the earliest historical point outside of... I, again, I, I think most scholars would predate Abraham as far as Job's storyline. Um, we don't get an actual storyline for Job. I don't think he is a Jew. That's my understanding of the story. I think he predates Israel. But regardless of the when, he's, he's not described as a Jew by any means. But he was a righteous man. And God blesses him richly. But that's not because he was part of the right kind of people. That's because Job himself was righteous and a believer and followed the right God. Uh, you can think about Ruth. Remember the story of Ruth? Ruth was a Moabite woman. She was not a Jew. And she's not going to be saved just because she marries a Jew. She's going to be saved because she places faith <clears throat> that God will take care of her, take care of her mother-in-law. Moabite woman is going to be saved. You can think of Melchizedek. Um, that may not be a name you often think of, but Melchizedek is this priest of Salem. He's not a Jew. He's actually going to do some spiritual stuff with Abraham. So again, kind of predates the whole Jewish circle. But in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is going to keep talking about Melchizedek, and Jesus is just a greater version of Melchizedek. He is this high priest for us. He is peace for us. Like, but Melchizedek, he gets a special recognition and honor and he wasn't a Jew. Uh, we can think of Moses' wife, right? Moses gets married, and she's not a, a Jew. He, he goes and finds this woman wandering in the wilderness, and her father is a priest, presumably of a different religion. And yet, she's going to be grafted into the Jewish story. Uh, let's see here. We can think of Rahab. Rahab is a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And she is then going to be an ancestor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And she's going to be spared when the rest of Jericho is destroyed. Maybe you remember a Naaman. Naaman is a Syrian war general. Again, I'll, I'll just point back to the, the issue of what's the point of reading Nahum. And Nahum talks about Syria and all of Syria's problems. This is a Syrian war general. And he's going to come with leprosy. He's going to be healed by the prophet Elisha. And then he's going to say, I know that your God is the one true God, and I'm going to worship him. And Elisha says, that's cool with me, man. Go and worship the one true God. Syrian war general grafted into God's family. Think about the story of the actual disciples. Matthew, a tax collector. Simon, a zealot. There's arguments of whether or not he's like truly like a an insurrectionist and a rebel and an anarchist against the Roman government, like that sort of terminology is this zealot concept. You put him and Matthew, whose actual name is Levi, but he changed his name to Matthew so he could work for the Roman government, put them side by side, and now they're disciples of Jesus. You've got Paul, who was killing a bunch of Christians, then became a Christian, then planted all these Christian churches. He was a Pharisee. Pharisees were often opposed to Jesus, but Paul's welcomed in because it's not about, well, he used to be a Pharisee. He used to be a tax collector. He used to be a zealot. The, who you used to be doesn't matter. It's are you going through the narrow door? And if you go through the narrow door, then God is going to welcome you in. God has done this from the beginning, from Genesis to Revelation. This is the story of God. You follow Jesus. You make that choice for you. And it doesn't matter what your background is. East, west, north, south, come from everywhere, anytime, any place, God will welcome you in through the narrow door. And I think that's, that is the emphasis of, of our Bible and the New Testament in particular. We belong to Jesus. We are saved by Jesus. I appreciate the Ephesians chapter 2 reference, one of my favorite passages. By grace, you have been saved through faith. It is Jesus who saves you. 
hey guys, I want you to go and do good works. Good works are great. That's just not what saves you. Go into church. I want you to go to church. That's just not what's going to save you. Jesus is going to save you. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. You come to Jesus and he will save you. We're going to offer an invitation this morning. If you've not come to Jesus and you would like to meet our Lord and Savior and you want to talk more about him, you want to meet him in the waters of baptism, we will do that. If you have been struggling with pain and grief or hurt or, or whatever is going on in your spiritual life, if we can help you, I'll invite you. We're going to stand and sing.